Hello, welcome to Communicating with Families. This webinar is part of the Let's Talk Quality webinar series, which has been created and facilitated by members of the Pennsylvania Keys Program Quality Assessment Team. This session was originally shared live in October 2021 by Amy Hoffman and Lisa Mulliken, both members of that Program Quality Assessment Team. I'm Amy, and I'm going to be sharing with you today. Like I said, I'm a program quality assessor and I live in the south central part of the state. Topics I'll be discussing today include what is good communication, barriers in communicating with families, some practical strategies and some examples of tools and methods you can use, and what do we do about those challenging situations. Sometimes throughout this webinar, I'll ask you to take a few moments to think about a topic. I won't pause for too long, but you can always hit pause on the recording to allow yourself more time to think. Today is just a brief overview of this topic. So, what is good communication? Take a moment to think about it. What do you think are some characteristics of good communication? I'm sure you came up with several. But here are a few that I wanted to share. Good communication is consistent. Your message that comes out to all families is consistent messaging. Good communication is goal oriented. It's clear and understandable. It conveys respect for the listener. It's open and allows for responses and it avoids assumptions. We have two ears and one mouth so that we can listen twice as much as we speak. I've heard it said many times that listening is the most important part of communication. Today I want to talk about three different types of listeners. One of those types is autobiographical. That's when you hear things that relate only to your own experience or perspective. Everything that you hear is filtered through the webs of your experience. Another type is merry-go-round listening. It's when you're waiting or biding your time until it's your turn to speak, which makes it a little bit challenging to be fully hearing what people are saying because you're so busy formulating the thoughts and your responses to what they're saying. And another type of listener is deep listening. That's when you're genuinely trying to understand and to learn something new. So think about it. Do you listen to family members when they talk to you? And when they are talking to you, what type of listening are you doing? Do you care about what they have to say? Do you think that you have all the answers or do you value their contributions? Until you value the input of family members, you'll never be able to exercise strong family communication. So here's another opportunity to think about it. What do you think are some barriers in communicating with families? Okay, what year did you turn 10? What influenced you? The culture around you would be what influenced you at that age. And research shows that value systems and beliefs are in place by the age of 10. So think of the families in your program different ages, differences in values, and there, of course, are several other barriers. Barriers can include a language barrier. Barriers can include different generations of families and staff. They also might include a family that might have a family member with special needs or a parent who might have a different level of education than the teaching staff. Sometimes family members have had negative experiences with school themselves when they were younger, and that can make it difficult for them to be able to trust and respect teachers. Sometimes there are single parent families, and it can be a challenge to make sure that the same message gets shared with both parents if the custody is shared. There are also families that are non-parent families. Often grandparents can be functioning as the parents or aunts or uncles or friends or siblings. So it's very important that we maintain awareness of the family makeup of the children in our program. Something that you might want to do is send home a home information sheet annually so that you can learn more about the families. 
I've heard, though, that the biggest barrier in communicating with families can be the attitudes of early childhood staff toward families and the attitudes of families toward early childhood staff. Sometimes families think that you're just a babysitter. They think you're daycare and that all you're doing is playing with their children all day. We know that you are doing so much more than that. We know that your job is so much more than babysitting. Of course, playing with the kids is a huge part of it, but we know that as you're playing with them that you're helping the children to learn and develop and grow. So it's important for you to view yourself as a professional. It can be tricky when families don't view you as such. That can definitely be a little bit of a barrier in communication. There's also, from your end, maybe you might have an unconscious bias against families. Have you ever heard yourself say or heard a colleague say, oh, you know how parents are? Well, it might sound kind of innocent, but that really can be an indicator of an unconscious bias. There, of course, are other barriers as well, and I'm sure that you've thought of some that I haven't even covered. Honestly, the most important practical strategy in communicating with families is for you to develop a positive relationship with the families. It's a partnership. We will talk a little bit more about that later, but on the last slide, I did mention about the home information sheet, and that is a fantastic way for you to learn to understand and respect the cultural differences of families. But really, investing in that relationship, that is going to help you so much with communication. And along with the practical strategies, here are some helpful tips. First of all, be clear and concise when communicating with families. Remember that giving information in that manner is so important. So mention positive things that their child enjoyed during the day. Frame negative statements in a positive manner. Try not to use words that say what the child was feeling, such as Sally was angry. Only use words that show what you observed. You're going to want to be aware of your body language. How you present yourself is also so important in effective communication. Even unconscious body language sends a message, so be thoughtful about the message you're sending. Be sure to use open and attentive body language to demonstrate active listening. Don't ignore the family members or make them feel as though you're not paying attention or as if they're inconveniencing you. Beware of your hands on your hips. I stand with my hands on my hips a lot, and I am aware that sometimes it makes me appear unapproachable. So do be aware of that. Another helpful tip is to listen intently. We did already mention that as the number one strategy for communication. It's important that the person you're speaking with knows that you're paying full attention to the conversation. By actively listening, you ensure that you're hearing the full message. Take time to hear their perspective. You might need to explain the reasoning behind a policy or a procedure. You can refer the family member to an administrator for further help if they're not satisfied with the answer you give them. Do yourself a favor and don't argue with a family member. It's just not going to accomplish anything. You also probably shouldn't tell a family member that something is done because it's the policy and we have to follow this rule because then it becomes you against the program and family members might not appreciate that. You also need to avoid promising a family member something that cannot be delivered, as tempting as it may be. So a few more helpful tips. Be consistent in your message. I did actually talk about this very briefly earlier, but something that has come up a lot lately have been COVID policies. Are you ensuring that you are consistently following them for every child in your program? Also, welcome frequent dialogue. When a family members talking to you, it's okay to say that you don't know as long as you get back to them. The phrase, I'm not sure, I'll find out for you, is a fantastic thing to say. You're going to want to maintain confidentiality. Think about a time someone shared something about you that you didn't want to be shared. Yikes, right? And as you're listening to family members and getting to know them, it is vital to remain a professional. Of course you want to be on good terms because that relationship is so important and you want to have that open communication. But when you cross professional boundaries, you can lose object objectivity and you can also lose their respect 
as well as the respect of your coworkers. I mentioned center policies earlier, and as a professional, you need to support those even when you don't agree with those. Complaining to family members about policies that you don't, that you don't like is not okay. It's demeaning to the company and it causes disunity. So what can you do to maintain professionalism? Well, you can talk about some items of a personal nature, but not your entire life. Don't use them as a sounding board for professional or personal reasons. And family members might try to get you to be a sounding board for them, but honestly, you're usually talking to them while you're around the children. And at that point in time, what's your job supposed to be? If they're trying to get you to be a sounding board and you're supposed to be engaging with the children, it's probably not a great idea. Here's another chance to think about it. What are some topics that families seem to care about the most? I'm sure you may have a list of them, but the most important topic that family members care about is their own child. They care about their child. How was their child's day? What did their child eat? How did they nap? How did toilet training go? They also care about how their child's developing. They care about their interactions. They care about what's going on in the classroom that pertains to their child. And of course, there are many other things that they care about, but when you're talking with family members, you want to talk about the things that they want to talk about, which are the topics that they do care about the most. So how do we talk with families about the topics they seem to care about the most? Here's just a couple helpful tips. Do feel free to offer suggestions when appropriate and when asked, as long as it's an appropriate suggestion. It's not always a good idea to offer your opinion. Do be sure to greet family members with a smile and to ask how their child is doing. If you're engaged with another group of children when a child arrives, be sure to look up and at least wave hello. If you're close enough, say hello. Also, do show respect for families and for their children. That's so important because people will know if you don't respect them and they'll really know if you don't respect their child. Here's some things that it's probably a good idea not to do. Don't expect gifts. Don't promise special treatment of a child by breaking policies. If you're going to text pictures or messages to family members, be sure to have the family member permission and your program's permission. Don't tell family members what to do with their child. And do not talk to a family about a child from another family. That goes back to that confidentiality issue. Do not talk about other children. Here are some examples of tools or methods that you can use to communicate with families. We recognize that during COVID communication has definitely been different and these might not all be practical right now. And we will talk about virtual communication in a little bit, but here we go. You want to communicate daily with families, and there's a couple different ways to do that. You can communicate with them written. You could use daily sheets or maybe hang a poster outside of the classroom door if families can come to the classroom so that they can see what occurred. You might be using an app as a program. If you are communicating with a daily sheet or with an app, be sure to include a specific comment about their own child. Remember, families want to hear about their own child. That's their most important topic. So be sure to include something specific. Written communication does need to always be positive. That includes on any app too. People can keep anything that is written and they could potentially use it against you. Anything you write could be taken literally. You also should provide daily oral communication, which of course is a little bit difficult when families can't come to classrooms or maybe even a lot difficult you might in, engage in phone calls. But if you are on a classroom team, all members of your classroom team should be able to chat with most families. Maybe you want a communication logbook between staff. There may be somebody who's there at the beginning of the day who is not there at the end of the day. And you never want to be faced with that situation where somebody comes in and said, what happened yesterday afternoon? If you have some kind of communication logbook between you and the other staff in your room, that will enable you to know what is going on. 
If you do end up in that situation, be sure to say, I don't have all the details right now, I will get them for you, and then be sure to follow up with them. You also could, could communicate with newsletters. So, why should you do this communication? Because families are trusting you with their children. Talk to families about what you see their children doing. What are some things that you can discuss? You can discuss some milestones, their demeanor, any new accomplishments, maybe an anecdote about an activity they enjoyed or some special activities that took place, maybe a new food that they tried, maybe an interaction with another child with, without, of course, naming that other child. Saying something like, Johnny had a good day is not enough. You need to go into more detail than that. And when you say things like, Johnny had a good day, you're focusing on behavior as opposed to w the other elements of what the child did during the day. You should, it's very important to refrain from behavior being the focus of your comments. Another example of a way to communicate with families is by hanging some photos in your lobby. If you're in a situation where families cannot come to your classroom, then if you have photos hanging in the lobby that families come into, they'll still be able to see what's occurring during the day. Be sure to change those photos often and be sure to include all children who you have photo permission for at some point in time. And here are some ideas for virtual communication. I've already mentioned apps. How about emails? Believe it or not, a lot of people still use email every day. I did already mention texts. If you are using text messages with families, be sure you have their permission and permission from your program. And really, you should use a work phone to send texts, not your own personal phone, if you're in a center setting. If you are a family provider or a group child care provider, there's a decent chance that the families already have your personal number. But if you're in a different situation, do try to use a work phone for that. Facebook is another idea for virtual communication or other forms of social media too. If you're using something like that though, be careful. You might want to make it where families can't post or maybe any comments that people make might need to be approved before they can be posted. You'll need to let families know ahead of time what your policy is on that. Facebook or other social media is actually a great way to promote whole program happenings or upcoming events. It could even, for families, provide community, kind of like what occur in the parking lot outside of your building. But just be careful and have clear policies in place about how you're going to use it and be sure your families know those policies. Family teacher conferences are another excellent way to communicate with families. In the conference, you're going to need to be positive. You honestly should never be hitting someone broadsided with something that they don't know if you're already exercising daily verbal communication and if you have that relationship with the family already. They should never be surprised at conference time. You're going to want to work to establish some goals together. What do you hope to accomplish and what do they want to see accomplished? Ask what they're seeing at home. Reporting on those goals that you set together verbally throughout the year and at each conference is a great topic of communication. When you're scheduling conferences, try to accommodate some family schedules. It might mean that you have to work outside of your normal work time and if that's the case, make modifications for it. Maybe choose one or two weeks and include different time blocks. Either stay late or come early one day if necessary. You also should include items that, share, that show growth. You need something to show families, so what are some things you could show families? Well, there's a whole lot, but here's just a few. You might have a summary of development, some kind of conference form, maybe some kind of progress report. You might use a portfolio which could include photos or anecdotal notes from observations that you've made of children. You might have work samples. The fun thing with portfolios is you can create one when the child enrolls in your program and it can be transferred from year to year. Sometimes if a child enrolls as an infant in a program and they end up aging out at the end of fifth grade or sixth grade, wow, think of the fascinating tale of growth that their portfolio could tell. Even if they come in at the age of three and age out at the age of five, there's so much growth that's going to be in that portfolio. When you put anything into a portfolio, you're going to want to ask yourself, why am I putting this in here? That portfolio really should be a compilation of items to document the child's time in your program and to document their developmental growth.
What do we do about those challenging situations? Here's the thing. If you maintain daily communication, you will already have a relationship when you need to talk about difficult situations. And if there is a difficult situation, do yourself a favor and go to the family with your concerns first. It's better than making them come to you. Talking about challenging situations could be its own webinar, so I'm only going to be able to go over a few tips with you today. One of those tips is to be a good observer. Record what's actually happening. No value judgments, but what is actually occurring. Highlight the positive. If you're discussing about a behavioral concern, writing negative is not okay. I already talked about that. Any behavioral concern should be discussed in person, either face-to-face, -face, via phone, or at a conference. When you do discuss a concern, always have a positive. A good rule is two positives for each negative. You could start with a positive, then there's the negative, and then end with the positive. Because think about it. Do you like to hear only what you're doing wrong? No. Or are you more receptive if you hear some positives as well? When a child is misbehaving and a parent is aware and admitting the issue, they're going to need all the positive that they can get. And if a family member is denying the problem, being negative will not help that situation. And remember, sometimes children have off days, just like we do. It's not always necessary to burden family members with that information. There may be some other negative situations too. Instead of getting defensive when a parent appears to attack you, try rephrasing what they're saying to be sure that you're hearing them right. Something like, what you're saying is, and then repeat it. Don't say, I understand how you feel. That, no, because it is their perspective. You need to assume that their point of view is accurate for them. From their side of the transaction, it is. Ask them for their perspective. Maybe they're feeling guilty because their child is at the program for such long hours. Maybe they feel guilty that they're missing things. Maybe they just had a rough day. It's important to hear that, that perspective. And with, in any challenging situation, whether it's behavior or some other situation, you're going to want to focus on problem solving as a team. When families don't feel like their child is cared for or valued by you, it's a big problem. They want to know that you're on their team. Ask them if they have ideas for next steps. So we're winding down and just take another moment to think about it. What is one thing that you will apply from this session in your ongoing communication with families? Maybe something new you learned or maybe just a reminder of something that you're already doing and doing well. As I mentioned in the beginning, this session is part of the Let's Talk Quality webinar series. This series runs the second week of each month. If you have any topics that you would like to hear us talk about, please email one of us and let us know. Our information will be coming up soon. Have you heard about the Let's Talk Quality blog at letstalkqualitypa.com? This blog includes posts that are relevant to early learning professionals and professionals who work with school-age children as well. A new article is posted every Wednesday. The blog post during the week of the Let's Talk Quality webinar will tie into the topic of that webinar. And we also have a Let's Talk Qu Quality Spotlight event. This will occur two weeks after each webinar. It's an opportunity for you to continue the conversation about that month's topic, which we talked about in the webinar and which a blog post was about. Or you can also ask the assessment team any questions that you might have for us. Thank you so much for taking time to listen to this webinar. Again, I'm Amy Hoffman. My contact info is there, and Lisa Mulliken was my original co-presenter, and there's also her contact information. Feel free to email us with any topics you might be interested in learning about, or any questions that you might have, or even any great ideas that you have for communicating with families. I'd love to hear them. Have a great day.